want to know more about the Normandy? She's the best ship I've ever served on. Probably the fastest vessel ever designed. And she's the only one using the new Tantalus Drive Core. The Tantalus Drive Core? What's so special about the Tantalus Drive Core? Proportionally, it's about twice the size of any other vessel. Not only are we faster, but we can run at FTL speeds longer before we have to discharge the core. Hey, Hill. Hill here. Gaming. And welcome back to more of the original Mass Effect. This is Hill, and we're here with our Commander Shepard on board the Normandy. We just rescued Liara from Therum, and we are back on board the ship. And before we set off on any other missions, um, one thing that uh, you should do when you're playing Mass Effect is chat with your crew and get to know them. It's an important part of the game. And uh, we're going to go over here and speak with Caden. And this is um, advised to do this after every mission. Is there, usually there's some new dialogue that's been added. Anything you need, Commander? What's your opinion on the last mission? Dr. Tassoni. Seems like a sweet girl. Easy on the eyes. <laughs> I mean, if you like the bookish sort. Just remember, Lieutenant, I saw her first. Only by a few seconds, sir. <laughs> Just trying to get a sense of where the crew's at. Thoughts? Is this an official evaluation, Commander? Or off the record? All right. Let's label it officially off the record. Got something on your mind? Straight up, there's something wrong with all of this. This Saren is looking for records on some kind of galactic extinction, but we can't get backup from the Council? Sorry, Commander. There's writing on the wall here, but someone isn't reading it. We've got our orders. Belly aching won't change them. I hear you. It, it just seems like a group that's been around as long as the Council should see this coming. Sorry if I got too informal. Protocol wasn't a big focus back in BOT. Tell me about it. Biotic acclimation and temperance didn't last past the airlock. To the kids they hauled in, it was brain camp. Sorry, hauled in is unkind. We were encouraged to commit to an evaluation of our abilities so an understanding of biotics could be compiled. There are worse results of accidental exposure to element zero in the womb. Beats the brain tumors some kids grew up with. Seems like you beat the odds. How many didn't make it? Out of a hundred, maybe sixty have no effect. Thirty suffer adverse effects, little things like brain cancer. The other ten show enough ability to augment with implants. Not always permanent, though. Not like the cancer. Next thing you know, you're out on jump zero. I mean, how's a kid supposed to deal with that? A station at the edge of human space. Jump Zero is Gagarin Station, right? What's it like? Yeah, that's the official name. Biggest and farthest facility we had for decades. Right on the termination shock, the outer edge of the solar system. It's where they did all the goose chase FTL research before we caught on to using mass effect fields. It was a sterile research platform when I was there. There were other kids in the same boat, right? At least you weren't alone out there. That's true. We did have a little circle that'd get together every night before lights out. We didn't have much to do, though. It was a research platform then, and Kinetics kept Jump Zero off the extranet to prevent leaks. You were all teenagers. I'm sure you found other ways to occupy the time. Hmm. I'm not the sort who does that kind of thing, Commander. Not lightly, anyway. There was a girl I spent a lot of time with. We kept our clothes on. Rana. She was from Turkey. Her family was very rich. But she was smart. And charming as hell. Beautiful. But not stuck up about it. I think you'd have liked her. Sounds like she was special to you. She was. Maybe she felt the same. But things never felt together. Training, you know. 
You know of any intentional exposures for certain? No one knows. Doesn't mean they didn't happen. As big as the exposures were, it was hard to track down accidentals. It was different then. No one knew the potential, so there wasn't a lot of regulation. Anything Kinetics did was gold. I'm not saying they intentionally detonated drives over our outposts, but in retrospect, they were damn quick on the scene. Jump Zero is a long way from home. What was it like? The grand gateway to humanity looks a lot better in the vids. But that's my own baggage, Commander. No bearing on this. It's a big galaxy, Lieutenant. Who knows what will come in handy? If you say so, sir. Besides, I've got my pass squared away. All right, we got 132 experience by chatting up Caden here and learning about his background. Um, let's see, I keep thinking that Garrus is back here, but that's a uh, Mass Effect 2. Okay, uh, let's go check on Liara, see how she's doing. Doctor. Commander, are you coming to check up on me? You look much better. How are you feeling? Dr. Chakwas assures me I am going to be fine. I was impressed with her knowledge of Asari physiology. Alliance medical personnel take courses in alien biology, just in case. I never properly thanked you for saving me from the Geth, Commander. If you hadn't shown up, I... I'm just glad we got there in time. So am I. I know you took a chance bringing me aboard this ship. I have seen the way your crew looks at me. They do not trust me. But I am not like Benezia. I will do whatever I can to help you stop Saren. I promise. Don't worry, Liara. I trust you. I know you won't let me down. It means a lot to hear you say that, Commander. Thank you. Tell me about yourself, Liara. Me? I am afraid I am not very interesting, Commander. I spend most of my time on remote digs, unearthing mundane items buried in long-forgotten Prothean ruins. Uh-oh. Shepard is getting his Mac on. Sounds dangerous. And lonely. Sometimes, I would run afoul of indigenous life forms or stumble across a small band of mercenaries or privateers. But I was always careful. Until the Geth followed me to Artemis Tau. I never found myself in any situation my biotics could not handle. As for the solitude, well, that is one aspect that most appealed to me. Sometimes, I just need to get away from other people. You don't like other people? I suppose it comes from being a matriarch's daughter. People expected me to follow in Benezia's footsteps. They wanted me to become a leader of our people. Matriarchs guide their followers into the future. They seek the truth of what is yet to come. Maybe that's why I became so interested in the secrets of the past. It sounds so foolish when I say it out loud. It sounds like I became an archaeologist simply to spite Benezia. You must enjoy something about it. I love my work. Seeking out history's lost secrets has a special appeal for me. You were actually touched by working Prothean technology. That is why I find you so fascinating, Commander. Sounds like you want to dissect me in a lab somewhere. What? No! I did not mean to insinuate... Uh, I never meant to offend you, Shepard. I only meant that you would be an interesting specimen for an in-depth study. Uh, no, that's even worse. Calm down, Liara. I was only joking. Joking? <laughs> oh, by the goddess! How could I be so dense? You must think I am a complete and utter fool. Now you know why I prefer to spend my time in the field with data disks and computers. I always seem to say something embarrassing around other people. Please, just pretend this conversation never happened. Do you know why Benezia joined up with Saren? I don't understand it. She was always outspoken about the need for the Asari to become more involved in shaping galactic events. Maybe she thought allying herself with Saren would somehow be for the greater good in the long run. 
At least I hope so. This hurts you, doesn't it? None of this makes any sense to me. I have not spoken to Venezia in many years, but I know her. And this was not like her. Something changed. I'd like to know more about the Asari. We were the first species to discover the Citadel. We were instrumental in forming the Council. And we always strive to be the voice of peaceful cooperation in galactic disputes. My people believe we are all part of a single galactic community. Each species contributes something to the greater whole. Although we seek to understand other species, it seems few of them seek to understand us. The galaxy is filled with rumors and misinformation about my people. Like what? Most of the inaccuracies are centered around our mating rituals. My species is monogendered. Male and female have no real meaning for us. We still require a partner to reproduce. This second parent, however, may be of any species and any gender. I don't understand. Your species can mate with anyone? Mating is not quite the proper term, not as you understand it. Physical contact may or may not be involved, but it is not an essential element of the union. The true connection is mental. Our physiology allows us to meld with other beings. We can touch the very depths of their minds. We explore the genetic memory of their species. We share the most basic elements of their individual and racial identities. We then pass these traits onto our daughters. It is how we learn to grow as a species and how we develop a greater understanding of other races. What happens to your partner after the union? Every relationship is different. Some unions are a single encounter with both parents parting ways afterwards. Others can be more long term. Sometimes an Asari and her partner will stay together for many decades. Do you know who Matriarch Benezia chose as her partner? She rarely spoke of her partner. Though I know my father, if you want to use that term, was another Asari. I thought you always needed another species to serve as one of the parents. Think about it, Shepard. If we were not able to mate with our own species, we would have died out long before we ever mastered spaceflight and left our homeworld. Union with our own kind is no longer common, not for the purposes of reproduction. Most Asari believe it weakens our species. Asari daughters inherit racial traits from the father species. If both parents are Asari, then nothing has been gained, or so conventional wisdom would hold. I am what is sometimes called a pureblood, though no Asari would ever be cruel enough to say the word to my face. It is a great insult among my people. It is possible Benezia's partner was embarrassed by their union. She may have been too ashamed to publicly acknowledge me as her offspring. Hmm. Why agree to the union if she didn't want any children? I cannot answer that. This is all speculation on my part. It is possible she wanted to be part of my life, but something happened to her before she had the chance. Benezia never spoke of her partner. Whatever happened, it caused her too much pain to dwell on it. She raised me by herself, though that is not uncommon. Many Asari raise their children alone, particularly if the father species is short-lived. Often the partner will pass on long before the child reaches maturity. You Asari live for a thousand years. What happens when your partner dies? Few sapient species live as long as my kind. We have learned to take a philosophical approach to our unions. We do not focus on the inevitable loss of our partners. Instead, we enjoy the time we spend with them. And even after they're gone, a part of them lives on in us. The union is a connection that transcends both time and space. <laughs> Sounds so deep. Okay, I think we have uh, learned as much as we can about um, Liara for the moment. So let's move on. I should go. Goodbye, Shepard. Okay, 99 experience. Um, I don't, does the doctor have anything else for us? Yes, Commander. Is there something you need? Uh, let's ask about Caden. How well do you know the Lieutenant? I'd never worked with him before this mission. But he has an impressive service record. Over a dozen special commendations. Tends to keep to himself, though. Maybe because of the headaches. It's not easy being an L2. What does that have to do with it? Well, most biotics now use the L3 implants. Lieutenant Alenko was wired with the old L2 configuration. Sometimes there are complications. 
What kind of complications? Severe mental disabilities, insanity, crippling physical pain. Oh my god. There's a long list of horrific side effects. Caden's lucky. He just gets migraines. Sounds like the side effects from the uh, medicines and stuff that they market uh, here in the present day. How did you end up serving on an Alliance ship? I enlisted right out of med school. Earth always seemed boring to me. Too safe. Too secure. I figured the colonies were teeming with exotic adventure. I wanted to travel the stars, tending the wounds of tough soldiers with piercing eyes and sensitive souls. <laughs> Turns out military life isn't quite as romantic as I'd imagined. But humanity needs the Alliance if we want to keep expanding through the Traverse. And the Alliance always needs good doctors. So I stayed on to do my part. Ever think you made the wrong choice? Sometimes I think about opening a private practice back on Earth. Or maybe taking a position at one of the new med centers out in the colonies. But there's something special about working on soldiers. If I left the Alliance now, I'd feel like I was abandoning them. Okay, thank you, I Doctor. I should go. Goodbye, Commander. All right, 33 more experience. Okay, let's go downstairs and check on our other crew members. So I think this episode is going to be mostly um, chatting up the crew. Alright, we've got Rex over here. Shepard. What can I do for you? What's your story, Rex? There's no story. Go ask the Quarian if you want stories. You Krogan lived for centuries. Don't tell me you haven't had a few interesting adventures. Well, there was this one time the Turians almost wiped out our entire race. That was fun. They tried the same with us. But we fought them off. It's not the same. It seems pretty much the same to me. So your people were infected with a genetic mutation? An infection that makes only a few in a thousand children survive birth? And I suppose it's destroying your entire species? I suppose it isn't all the same. I don't expect you to understand. But don't compare humanity's fate with the Krogan. Sorry, Rex. I wasn't trying to get you upset. Your ignorance doesn't upset me, Shepard. Mm. As for the Krogan, I gave up on them long ago. The genophage infected us, but it's not what's killing us. What can you tell me about the genophage? Ask the Salarians if you want details. They made it. All I know, it makes breeding nearly impossible. Thousands die in stillbirth, and most never get that far. Every Krogan is infected, every one. And no one's rushing to find a cure. Why don't the Krogan try to find a cure? When was the last time you saw a Krogan scientist? You ask a Krogan, would he rather find a cure for the genophage or fight for credits? He'll choose fighting every time. It's just who we are, Shepard. I can't change that. Nobody can. Are your people really dying? We're sure not getting any stronger. We're too spread out. None of us are interested in staying in our own system. Lots of species have left their homes and prospered. But they go to colonize new worlds. We're not settlers. We're warriors. We want to fight. So we leave. Hire ourselves out. And most of us never go back. Okay, so that's Rex's story. So long, Rex. Shepard. Alright, 66 experience. And by talking with the crew, 
um, eventually everyone is going to give you a mission maybe not everyone but most people <laughs> okay uh, yeah we don't really need to see these lockers all right Ashley commander you have a minute to talk is this duty related chief no sir well maybe I know things are different aboard the Normandy, but uh, I'm I'm concerned about the aliens, Vicarian and Rex. With all due respect, Commander, should they have full access to the ship? You don't trust their motives because they're not human. This is the most advanced ship in the Alliance Navy. I don't think we should give them free reign to poke around the vital systems. Engines, sensors, weapons. Hmm. All right, I don't want to cut off all relations with her just yet. I'll, I'll try to be neutral in dealing with her for now. I'm not going to lock them in the sleeper pods for the whole trip, Williams. I'd be more comfortable if they didn't have access to engineering and the CIC. We, humanity, I mean, have to learn to rely on ourselves. How do you get from relying on ourselves to mistreating our allies? I don't mean we should mistreat them, Commander. I just think we should be prepared to go it without them. As noble as the council members seem now, if their backs are against the wall, they'll abandon us. I don't see that as inevitable. Look, if you're fighting a bear and the only way for you to survive is to sick your dog on it and run, you'll do it. As much as you love your dog, it isn't human. It's not racism, not really. Members of their species will always be more important to them than humans are. You sound like one of those terra firma party pamphlets, Chief. Terra firma is a pack of jackals. The founders had ideals. These days they just play off xenophobia and bigotry. I hope my reasons are more rational. My father, grandfather, great-grandmother, they all picked up a rifle and swore the oath of service. I guess we just tend to think of Earth's interests as our own. I never knew my family. Grew up an orphan on Earth. Anybody in your family I'd have heard of? Couldn't say, Commander. So why are you out here? Just trying to get away from Earth? I'm here to put hypervelocity rounds through the heads of bad guys. Hmm. Most satisfying part of the job, Commander. <laughs> I guess so. Okay, let's talk about her service. It doesn't sound like you've worked with aliens before. No, sir. Mainly I've been groundside, part of the surface garrison forces. I did get a rotation on a space station for training. Every Marine a rifleman, every rifleman ZG certified. That's odd. Your record is spotless and your technical scores are exemplary. You should be serving with the fleet. Anyway, that's why I haven't served with many aliens, Commander. Hmm. All right. I can see where your concerns are coming from, Williams. But this is a multilateral mission. You're going to have to work with aliens, like it or not. It won't be a problem, Commander. You say jump, I say how high. You tell me to kiss a Torian, I'll <laughs> ask which cheek. Oh, 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 oh. Shepard? Would you kiss anyone I ordered you to? That depends, sir. If you ordered me to kiss a superior officer, that would be a violation of the regs concerning fraternization. That would make it an illegal order. I'd be required to decline and relieve you of command. Hmm. Sir. What's your opinion on the last mission? Not sure I buy Dr. Tassoni's story about her and her mom not talking. They're family, right? Not everyone has a happy family life. No, I guess not. Too bad those ruins got destroyed. I mean, they lasted thousands of years. That's impressive. All right, so... We'll sweet talk Ashley and Liara for the moment and see where that gets us. We'll talk later, Williams. Looking forward to it, sir. All right, 66 experience. Okay, I think we have two more people to talk to. It's Garrus. Commander, nice work out there. I knew working with a Spectre would be better than life at CSEC. Have you worked with a Spectre before? Well, no, but I know what they're like. Spectres make their own rules. You're free to handle things your way. But CSEC, you're buried by rules. The damn bureaucrats are always on your back. 
For the most part, the rules are there for a reason. Maybe. But sometimes it feels like the rules are only there to stop me from doing my work. If I'm trying to take down a suspect, it shouldn't matter how I do it, as long as I do it. But CSEC wants it done their way. Protocol and procedure come first. That's why I left. So you just quit because you didn't like the way they do things? There's more to it than that. It didn't start out bad, but as I rose in ranks, I got saddled with more and more red tape. CSEC's handling of Saren was typical. I just couldn't take it anymore. I hate leaving. It's not the end of the world. You'll have tougher decisions soon enough. Yeah, I suppose you're right. Either way, I plan to make the most of this. And without CSEC headquarters looking over my shoulder, well, maybe I can get the job done my way for a change. As long as you do your job well, you're free to go about your business as you see fit. Thank you, Commander. What? what? I didn't get any experience at all? I feel cheated. Okay, um, let's inspect the Mako. Alright, I got 33 experience. At least that's something. And let's talk to this requisitions officer. Hey, Commander. Looking for some extra supplies before you head out? What have you got? Whatever you want. Armor, weapons, mods. It's not standard Alliance issue, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Well, as long as you don't mind paying for it. Why should I pay you for my weapons and armor? My stuff doesn't come from the Alliance. I have to purchase it myself, and it's not cheap. Hell, the licenses alone have set me back more than I'd like. But no licenses, no goods. Without the goods, I'm out of a job. And that's what I was buying in the Citadel in those shops as, as uh, licenses so that this guy here can buy, you know, some good stuff for us, some good weapons and whatnot. How often will you get new items? Well, that depends on how many licenses you've purchased. But I'll rotate items on a regular basis regardless. And any time we land someplace with a big enough port, I'll buy, sell, and trade whatever I can. Check back often. I need to move items quickly, so only the most basic items will be stocked consistently. What are licenses? Why do you need them? Manufacturers sell licenses. Each license allows me to buy and sell a certain brand of products. I already have several basic ones, but you'll need to buy more if you want me to bring in different brands. Many of the best licenses are hard to get, but they're well worth the cost if you can find them. What do the different manufacturers offer? There are too many for me to keep track of, but each license will explain what it's good for. Okay, let's see what he's got. I let's know see I what you've got. Can't afford you bet, it. Commander. Well, our money is going up. We have almost fourteen thousand credits now, but that will not buy us any of this stuff. And it looks like, excuse me, he's carrying Spectre weapons. Wow be nice to be able to get some of these. Okay, a Metagel upgrade. And what is this one? A grenade upgrade. How much are these? 200? Might as well. Okay. What do I have that I might be able to sell? rid of these hammerhead rounds. Motorized joints. Shock absorbers. Okay. Got an awful lot of toxic seals. We'll get rid of some of those. Um, this assassin armor, I don't think we really... Uh, that's all I'm getting is 200 credits. Wow, I'm gonna sell it though. 200 for that. 250. Ooh, look at this Banshee 3. Okay, I'll sell that. Okay. Alright, um. I think we should be good for now. Probably don't need this many heat sinks. Let's get rid of one of them. Mm, 
All right, we'll we'll keep all this for now. All right, so we got 33 experience by talking to him. And finally, the engine room. We can pick up some experience here, I think. Yeah, examine. Okay, 33 experience. Let's talk with Engineer Adams. Hey, Commander, you know that Quarian Tally? She's been spending all her time down here asking me about our engines. I'll tell her to leave you alone. What? No, she's amazing. I wish my guys were half as smart as she is. Give her a month on board and she'll know more about our engines than I do. She's got a real knack for technology, that one. I can see why you wanted her to come along. No, we're not gonna say I didn't. Um... Let's talk about the stealth systems. Now let's talk about the Normandy. I wanna know more about the Normandy. She's the best ship I've ever served on. Probably the fastest vessel ever designed. And she's the only one using the new Tantalus Drive Core. The Tantalus Drive Core? What's so special about the Tantalus Drive Core? Proportionally, it's about twice the size of any other vessel. Not only are we faster, but we can run at FTL speeds longer before we have to discharge the core. Fill me in on the IES stealth systems. How does it work exactly? You can't hide a ship out in space. They emit too much heat and radiation. Too easy for sensors to pick them up, unless you find a way to capture those emissions. So our stealth systems trap the energy we give off in storage sinks built into the ship itself. No emissions to give away our location. Eventually the sinks have to be vented. More than a few hours silent running and they overheat. Cook us inside our own hull. There's no way for anyone to detect us? A visual scan can still pick us up. Anyone looking out a window can see us plain as day. But you have to be pretty close to get an actual visual out in space. Most vessels rely on scanners. As long as the stealth systems are engaged, they can't see us. Not unless we accelerate to FTL speeds. Why doesn't it work with faster than light travel? Cranking up the FTL blue shifts our emissions, pushes them into frequencies too high to capture in the sinks. As soon as we make the jump, it's like setting off a flare. Sensors can pick up our location whenever we enter or exit FTL flight, but for short-range missions, our stealth systems are amazing, and we've got the only one. Where else have you served, Adams? If you name a class of Alliance ship, I've probably served on it. Everything from dreadnoughts and carriers right down to frigates like the Normandy. My last assignment was on the Tokyo. Only a cruiser, but she was a good ship. Couldn't hold a candle to the Normandy, though. Carry on, Adams. Aye, aye, Commander. Oh, 99 experience. All right, I think this is our final crew member to talk with. Tally. Your ship's amazing, Shepard. I've never seen a drive core like this before. I can't believe you were able to fit it into a ship this small. It's a tantalus I'm drive core. I understand why you humans have been so successful. I had no idea Alliance vessels were so advanced. The Normandy's a prototype. Cutting edge technology. A month ago, I was patching a makeshift fuel line into a converted tug ship in the flotilla. Now, I'm sitting on board one of the most advanced vessels in Citadel space. I have to thank you again for bringing me along. Traveling on a vessel like this is a dream come true for me. I had no idea you found ship technology so interesting. It comes with being a Quarian. The migrant fleet is the key to the survival of my people. Ships are our most valuable resource. But we don't have anything like this. We make do with cast-offs and second-hand equipment. We just try to keep them running for as long as we can. Some of the fleet's larger vessels date all the way back to our original flight from the Get. I can't believe your fleet's still using ships that are three centuries old. They're constantly being repaired, modified, and refitted. They aren't pretty, but they work. Mostly. We've tried to make ourselves as independent as possible on the flotilla, grow our own food, mine, and process our own fuel. But some things we just can't make on our own. A patch to maintain the hull integrity requires raw materials we just don't have. That's why our pilgrimages are so important. I want to know more about the pilgrimage. When my people reach maturity, we leave our birth ships and seek acceptance with a new crew. It's necessary to maintain genetic diversity among the fleet. 
But no ship wants to accept someone who will be a burden on them. So, to prove our worth, we embark on a pilgrimage. We set out alone, leaving the flotilla and our families behind us. We only return once we have found something of value we can bring back to the fleet. This is presented as a gift to the captain of the respective ship we wish to join. If the gift is accepted, we are welcomed into the crew. Can a captain choose to reject the gift? That doesn't happen often. Most captains are eager to increase the size of their crew. It increases their own standing in our society. Even when a gift is not particularly valuable, the captain usually accepts it out of a sense of tradition. However, there is a stigma to presenting a substandard gift. Hmm. It's not the best way to make a good impression on a new community. Most pilgrims don't return until they find something worthwhile. I can't believe they just send you off alone. It's not like they just cast us out. Before we leave, we are given lessons in how to survive outside the flotilla, and given gifts to help us on our journey. We also receive implants to fight off sickness and disease. Generations of living in an isolated and highly controlled environment have left our immune systems weaker than most. By the time we leave the fleet, we are well equipped for the pilgrimage. This is a rite of passage for all Quarians. If it were dangerous, our numbers would suffer. Virtually every pilgrimage ends with a triumphant return and the ritual presentation of the gift to one of the fleet's captains. I want to talk about something else. Like what? I want to know more about the Geth. I doubt I can tell you anything you don't already know. It's been almost three centuries since they drove my people into exile. All I know is the story of their origins. What they were when we created them, and how they turned on us. Interesting. The Geth were originally created to serve as an automated manual labor force. Initially, their intelligence was as limited as any VI. Over time, we made small modifications to their programming to allow them to perform more varied and complex tasks, bringing them closer and closer to true AI status. How come the Council didn't step in and stop you? This wasn't true AI research. We may have been skirting the bounds of the law, but we never did anything that was actually illegal. The changes were so insignificant, so gradual, that we were able to control them. Or so we thought. But one thing we underestimated was the power of the neural network. A million Geth thinking simultaneously created an inherently unstable matrix. So, the Geth share brain power? Many of the Geth's logic systems were designed to work in concert with other nearby Geth. Basically, the more of them you have in the group, the smarter they are. So there's some sort of group consciousness? No, nothing like that. They cannot share sensory data or information. Their programming cannot handle that much simultaneous input. Each Geth maintains an individual awareness and identity. The neural network only operates on a process-based level. It's basically the synthetic equivalent of a subconscious. But, when they're in close proximity, they can coordinate low-level functional processes, freeing up more capacity for original or independent thought. What made them rebel? As we built more and more Geth, their effective intelligence became more sophisticated, more abstract. One day, a Geth began to ask its Quarian overseer questions about the nature of its existence. Am I alive? Why am I here? What is my purpose? As you can imagine, this caused a near panic among my people. You were becoming sentient. I don't see what's so bad about those questions. The Geth were created to engage in mundane, repetitive, or dangerous manual labor. That's fine for machines, but it won't satisfy a sentient being for long. The Geth were showing signs of rudimentary self-awareness and independent thought. Exactly. If the Geth were intelligent, then we were essentially using them as slaves. Yep. It was inevitable the newly sentient Geth would rebel against their situation. We knew they would rise up against us, so we acted first. A general order went out across all Quarian-controlled systems to permanently deactivate all Geth. 
the Geth responded to this order violently. You didn't really think they'd just let you destroy them without a fight, did you? The hope was that most of the Geth would still be little more than machines, incapable of organized resistance. But they had progressed much further than anyone anticipated. The war was long and bloody. Millions upon millions of Quarians died at their hands. In the end, we were forced to flee our own homeworld. We feared the Geth would pursue us, but they never came beyond the Veil. Vale. Now, we drift through space, exile, searching for a way to reclaim what was once ours. Um, he's gonna be a little bit negative here. You got what you deserved. We made a mistake when we created the Geth in the first place, but we did not make a mistake when we went to war against them. If we had not acted, they would have wiped us out. They're a synthetic life form. They have no use for organics. None. Why do you think they cut themselves off from the rest of the galaxy? Why do you think they've killed every organic being who's ever tried to contact them? They didn't kill Saren. What does that tell you? The Geth are not innocent victims in all this. They're the enemy. They want to destroy us. Not just the Quarians. All organic life. That's why they've joined up with Saren, and that's why we have to stop him. Tell me about your people. Our lives aren't easy. Resources are scarce, and we are constantly on the move. Everything we do must in some way contribute to the continuation of the migrant fleet. There are 17 million Quarians in the flotilla, and each of us relies on the others for survival. The bonds among my people are strong. Unfortunately, we have had to surrender many of the freedoms and civil liberties other species take for granted. What kind of freedoms? Well, it's illegal for parents to have more than one child. Hmm. If our population grows too much, it would strain our resources to their breaking point. Of course, we also can't allow our numbers to become too few. If our population is in decline, the rule against single births is temporarily repealed. In extreme cases of population decline, incentives are even offered to encourage multiple births. Though the Conclave hasn't had to take such measures in nearly a century. The Conclave? That's your government. The Conclave is our civilian branch of government. Each ship can elect a representative to serve on the Conclave and make decisions that affect the fleet as a whole. On matters that affect an individual ship, however, the captain has the final say. It's a tradition that dates back to the early days, when the fleet was governed by martial law. Fortunately, most captains nowadays are smart enough to have an elected council from their crew to give them advice and guidance. So the ultimate power rests with elected officials? In practice, the Conclave and the respective council for each ship tend to set the rules that govern our daily lives. But in theory, we are still under military jurisdiction. The five top-ranking military officials in the fleet serve on the Admiralty Board. These five have the power to overrule any decision by the Conclave in case of emergency. To do so requires unanimous agreement among the Admiralty. And they can only do this once. After that, the entire board must resign their posts. It's a safeguard that served us well. In nearly three centuries, the Admiralty Board has only overruled the Conclave four times. Okay, I think that's quite enough. Thank you, Tally. I should go. See you later. Oh, oh, 132 experience. Okay. All right, well, hopefully we are due for a level up soon. So that's the crew. Get to meet the crew. I think um, Joker is the only other person up on the bridge. But um, I don't think he has all that much to say. And we will probably talk with him in a subsequent uh, episode. But um, we're going to go ahead and end our recording here. And in our next episode, hopefully, we're going to see some action. Thank you all for watching. This is Hill. And I'm out.